you got your Bibles, I'm going to start, well, I'm not going to start for a little bit, but I'm going to, I think we're going to start around John chapter 14. And while you're turning there, um, I want to give a little bit of an announcement about the website. We're working on the, the Bride of Christ as a separate page in itself because of the emphasis that God's laid on this church and on me, especially looking at the ten virgins we've talked about and the church at Ephesus returning to its first love. John chapter 14, or 17, I'm sorry. And um, so we took one page that we weren't using on the website on the articles, and we took the articles off because I don't, I don't do much writing. But anyway, um, so we made that page. I'm looking at it right now, so I'm not looking at you. Um, we made that page the bridal paradigm because that's what Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, which I think we related to. I think we're the church at Ephesus as well as maybe other people, but I'm not, I'm not responsible for them or individuals, but for myself and what we're doing here, which is a, a call to restore first love. But anyway, so we dedicated this page, and when you get there, on the front page, it'll say, um, they have those buttons, and you'll see Bridal Paradigm, and then when you, you um, hit into that, now this is what I'm looking at, it's going to have the Bridegroom Fast, and then it's going to go into a, the Song of Solomon, which we've got three up there right now, part one, two, and three of introduction, but I added um, over the weekend... I felt like the Lord inspired me to add some more um, on the bridal paradigm. So one's going to one of the series is going to be the Song of Solomon. The other series is going to be the bridal paradigm, which is the awakening of the bride. That's that's the bridal message. And then it's then we've got bridal partnership messages on there. What it means to be a partner of the bride. And then we've got the bridal call and destiny. And there are a bunch of sermons and videos of past teachings where I've taken what we've talked about over the, especially the last year, and categorized them as they are categorized on YouTube as well to some degree, but mostly here. And then we're going to keep adding to this. If it's a bridal message, it'll come under the bridal paradigm messages. If it's a bridal partnership, it'll come under that. And, um, and then the call and destiny, which we've talked a lot about the call and destiny. So um, anyway, that is there for you to um, look at. And almost, I, I don't know, I'm guessing on this, but it's almost like if Paul had a website, or not Paul, whoever the pastor was at the church at Ephesus, I think he would do this. If that was the message to Ephesus, is the return to the first love, and he had a website, I think he would do this. I don't know, my opinion. But it's there for you to, um, to uh, look, at, look at and to um, share with other people that may not necessarily go here. Because they don't have to go to church here. This is not about coming to church here. It's about having a, a relationship with Jesus. And this will help. This page will make the first things first, the primary thing that we missed getting saved, they can get. Or we can restore or renew. So that's, that's there for you as well. So um just want to welcome some people from new people from um, our Bible study, Ken and Sue and, and Jay. Um, and what's the little girl's name? Brooke. Brooke. Anyway, so I want to say something about Jay that you guys shared with me um, after the Bible study on him and a little debate at school. Now if I get it wrong interrupt me and say no but we're talking about and I think this is he's what eight years old all right so he comes with his Bible he comes with his notes and, and everything and and listens intently probably more than most of us adults listen to but that's all right he's zeroed in but this is what I found out and this is for everybody here and those listening about Thursday night when we're doing spirit soul and body now there's a message 
And it's, it's a mentality that, you know, we're training our spirits, but we're really not because the spirit is perfect. It's complete. You don't train something that's perfect. And then you have to ask the question, well, who's training my spirit? Think about it. If, 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 if the spirit needs trained, and I'm born of the spirit that needs trained, who's training the spirit? Surely not me and my unrenewed new beginnings, you know, unrenewed mind. I can't. I don't know anything. Can you, how many remember the day you got saved? You knew nothing. How was you going to train him? Man. No, it's the opposite. The spirit trains the soul. Not the soul training the spirit. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he got into a debate with somebody at school, and these are eight-year-olds. And, and somebody had said to him about training the spirit, right? And he said, go, you can go ahead. And, what did he say back? Or what did you say back? <laughs> I mean, he came right, uh-uh, you don't train, he, he got, that's eight years old, and we've got a guy on TV right now who's in his 80s telling you to train your spirit. So, eight years old knows more than an 80-year-old man, but more than that, eight years old, he's way ahead of me when I was eight years old. So I can't imagine what that guy's going to look like when he's in his 80s, if he's got that under his belt now, so... Um, I think that's awesome. That's awesome. So anyway, that's a praise report to me. I think that's just, that's amazing. Anyway, the bridegroom and the bride. So we're looking at, look at the board here real quick. In the Old Testament, you've got a lot said about the bride. In the New Testament, you have a lot, which we're going to fill in this. But on the Old Testament, I just want you to see... This thing starts off in Genesis chapter 2 with Adam and Eve. There's a marriage in the garden, husband and wife. Then in Genesis 24, I think it's 24, either 24 or 25, is a picture of Abraham sending his servant out to get a bride for Isaac. And that's Jesus sending the Holy Spirit throughout the world to get a bride for Isaac. And we are that bride. And the Holy Spirit is a servant drawing people unto themselves. And we have the perfect picture of the bride and bridegroom here in Genesis 24 or 25. Then you've got the Song of Solomon, which that whole, that whole book is about. And that's what we're looking at on Monday nights um, on the radio. We, we actually stick it up there, I think, on Monday nights. And then you get the outline sometimes Monday. But that's the Song of Solomon. And then we're adding those to the website if you miss them on the radio. But anyway, Isaiah talks about the bride. Jeremiah talks about the bride. Ezekiel talks about the bride. And then the Old Covenant ends, the Old Testament ends, with Malachi prophesying John the Baptist by saying Elijah will come back. And John the Baptist comes to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare the way of the bridegroom. So this whole old, if you see the whole Bible unfold like this, it starts off with a wedding. Then we're going to show you that in the book of Revelation, <coughs> it ends. I think it's 19. Ends in a wedding. So it, I mean, so when you look at, you open up the Bible. These are two bookends. It starts off with a wedding in Genesis. It ends with a wedding in Revelation. And the whole thing is restoring the. Well, the Holy Spirit getting a bride for Jesus. And then you find out that the cross is strictly about getting that bride. Because the bride is, you know, in like the Song of Solomon, I am dark. She's sinful. But Jesus comes to make us righteous so he can get a bride. So he prepares us for the wedding. The cross not only makes us the bride... But it prepares us for the wedding so that when we show up, Ephesians says, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Just like that bride shows up on her wedding day in that wedding gown, perfect, the makeup, the hair, there's no flaw. So the Holy Spirit will prepare us, but we're already complete in spirit, but in body and soul, he's preparing us for that wedding day to be without spot or wrinkle. So is that, do, you, do you see that? This is all about the bride and the bridegroom. So what we're going to do, and we may return to the Old Testament overview, but today we're looking at the New Testament overview, which I, you're going to find, I hope, I know it did with me, um, very uh, eye-opening. So if you've got your outline there, 
Um, and they, they, I sent those to you in the email. So if anybody's watching by way of internet and they want these outlines, they're going to have to send me their email so I can send them the outlines for um, Sunday morning and Thursday night. So anyway, we've got re the revelation of the bride in the New Testament. All right. So to have a bridal paradigm of the kingdom is to have a perspective of the kingdom through the lens of bride. So you have to understand you are the bride. That's your identity. But before you can get that, you have to understand that Christ is the bridegroom. So Jesus B, Jesus and John. Now I'm not going to go through this outline. That's The outline is mostly for you to take home or at home and go through. There's no way I'm going to get through this outline as it is. We'd be here for two hours. So I'm going to highlight this outline. I'm not going to go word by word. So B, Jesus and John the Baptist spoke of the bridegroom. Rather than the bride, seeing Jesus as our bridegroom, God awakens understanding of who we are before him as his cherished bride. We see the truth of our identity by understanding his identity. And then when we behold him, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we're changed from glory to glory. So that means as I see God, Christ, as the bridegroom, and I'm the bride, and in that relationship I behold him, my transformation is inevitable. Paul wrote of Jesus' union with the bride, and two, he tells us he's betrothed us to one husband, which we talked about last week. See, Jesus' miracle ministry begins at the wedding at Cana. Now, we're not going to look at that in chapter 2, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of highlight on that. The wine, remember what happens at the wedding of Cana. They run out of wine. So, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. They had been invited to that wedding. And his mother says they ran out of wine, do something. And he's like, I can't do anything because my time is not yet. He didn't know his time was really right around the corner within a matter of minutes. He doesn't know that. He just He's waiting to be unveiled until the father says, now is the time to go into your earthly ministry. Up to that point, he's a carpenter. He's working on tables and chairs and things like that. So um, he's, he's just waiting for God to unveil him to the bride as the bridegroom. And it's funny that his ministry starts at a wedding. It's not a, it's not a coincidence. It just happened to be a wedding. It could have been anything. But it was a wedding that his ministry starts at. And if you look at your outline, you'll see that the wine points to the celebration of God's love at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me just back, let me just sidebar something here. There's a debate on whether the wine had alcohol in it, whether it didn't have alcohol in it, and the church, that is always the debate when you talk about the wedding at Cana. What did the God mean when he said you saved the best for the last? Let's not get into that debate. All that is is to get your attention off of, get what that man said. You save the best wine. It doesn't matter what it was. Forget it. Understand the, the spiritual um, significance that the best wine was saved for last, meaning that you had all the old covenant, then Jesus is going, his ministry is going to be unveiled right there, and that water is going to be turned into the best wine, and God saves the best wine for the new covenant believers as well as that wedding that's coming called the church age. It starts with, the, with, with Jesus' ministry at this wedding of Canaan where he unlooses that wine, and it's going to go all the way to the wedding of uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So don't get caught up on was it alcohol, was it non-alcohol. To me, that is the most frivolous thing to even debate. You're missing the whole point of what this story is about. God's unveiling his son who is saving the ministry of the spirit, the wine, the new covenant, grace for the very end, which is really the beginning of the new covenant. Does that make sense? You see it right there. So he saves the best wine until the new covenant and the final hour of natural history when his power and revelation are released in the greatest measure in the context of preparing his bride for the wedding um, of the Lamb. That's Revelation uh, 12. So this whole thing is about a bride. Not what he can do for you or what you can do for him. That's included. But the primary thing in this thing is about a wedding and a bride. It's about a marriage, a relationship, love. All right? So, go to, to, you can turn your page there and go to number two. Now, let's look at John the Baptist. So, Jesus unveiled. Now, a while later, 
I don't know how long later, but maybe some, some say that that wedding was like in 27 AD. So if Jesus gets unveiled in, in three years, I don't know the time or how exactly what went on in that period. We don't know. We just know his first miracle, which was his first miracle ministry, was around 27 AD. And we don't know all that happened, but here we're picking up John the Baptist, which is probably around 30 AD. So about a month after Cain, and now it says here about a month, I'm not sure. This is where you get that time frame period where people are not sure what happens. But Jesus was revealed by John the Baptist as the bridegroom God in John 3, 29. So if you're in John, go ahead and look at John 3, 29. Don't get caught up on the time frame. It doesn't matter whether we get this time frame right or not. It's in succession. John chapter 3, and look at verse 29. Now listen to what, what John the Baptist says. He's already said, that's the, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You yourselves, verse 28, bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And that's what Malachi, ending the Old Testament, talks about, that he would be sent. Now look at verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Now that's John the Baptist. Now he's the forerunner. Of Jesus. In other words, he's prepared. No one knows about Jesus until John says, There he is. And let me tell you, he who has the bride, that's you that he's talking to, has the bridegroom. Okay? He who has the bride has the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is made full. So we've got three players here the bride. The bridegroom and the friends of the bridegroom. All right? One, two, three. Who's the bride? Us. Us. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. We'll say church. The church is the bride. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. God is the bridegroom. Who's the friends of the bridegroom? That's where you may be a little... Oh, wait a minute. I thought I was the bride. Now he says he's the friends of, friends of the bridegroom. So who are these friends of the bridegroom? Now understand what the friend of the bridegroom is. John the Baptist is the one pointing to... So you've got the church, these people Israel. First he goes to the Jew. And then he says they're... To the Israel, there's the bridegroom, and he has the bride, and I'm the friend of the bridegroom, pointing you to him. So the friends of the bridegroom, you would say, is John the Baptist, yes, but what does he represent? He, re he represents those who carry the message, those who preach the gospel. It could be the leaders in the church, and that could be even you, <clears throat> leaders in the church. So you got the bride as the church and the friends of the bridegroom as the ones ministering the message to the bride about the bridegroom. So does that make sense? So you're the bride and you are the friend of the bridegroom when you are pointing other people to the bride. Yeah, you yourself are the bride, but the minute I say minister Jesus to you or point Jesus to you, as the bride, I become the friend of the bridegroom pointing you to him. Does that make sense? It's important that you understand that because anytime you speak for Jesus in witnessing or as light, you are basically pointing, you're like John the Baptist. You're, you're crying out, the bridegroom is coming. Prepare for the bridegroom who's coming. All right? That's what evangelists do. That's what light does. That's what salt does. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Because if you, if you don't get that, you're going to miss this whole thing. So, we as the church has fivefold ministry could be could be considered friends of the bridegroom. Every every body has ministry, and Paul calls us all ministers. So to some degree, you are a friend of the bridegroom, pointing others to the bridegroom, though you yourself are part of the bride. Okay. Anyway, so here's what he says: He's the bridegroom. So he IDs Jesus as the bridegroom, and that speaks. What's, what's the bridegroom speak of? A deep desire for relationship. He could have said, there's the king. There's Messiah. 
there's the Lamb of God. And he did. But he, he uses bridegroom. And say, well, why is he using the picture of marriage? Because that shows you he's there to have a deep love relationship with you, the bride. There's a reason he's using bridegroom. Because if he doesn't use that, you're going to get caught up in just the religious mode of church. And I'm telling you, that'll kill you. All you'll be about is rules and rituals, which I'm going to show you. That's what John's disciples were about, <coughs> rules and rituals. We're going to look at that here in a minute. B, the Father sent John as his messenger to tell Israel about Jesus. And he says, Behold, I, the Father, send my messenger before you, Jesus, who will prepare your way before you, Matthew 11, 10. So John is the end of the law and the prophets. Over here, John is the end of the Old Covenant, which is the Old Testament. John and the prophets end in John to point the New Covenant and Jesus is the bridegroom, okay? So, which is preparing the way. C, John's most detailed message about Jesus is in John 3, 27 through 36. Let's turn there. Some of it's on your outline, but if you want to turn there in your Bibles, John 3. Now, this is, I'm just, this is all introduction, really, but we get to this message here. John chapter 3. And let's look at verse 27. Well, let's, let's just go up a little bit. Verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown in prison. Verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John, verse 26, and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing and all are going to him. So you've got a problem here. They're talking about doctrine, purification, rituals. They're, talk, they're, they're, they're talking about the fact that we used to have 300s coming, 300 plus coming out, baptizing people, and all of a sudden this Jesus whom you testified as this Messiah, all of a sudden now they're going over to him, and they're baptized, he's bapt, baptizing them or the disciples. So you've got to put some flesh and blood on this. Now watch this. This is, this is crucial as friends of the bridegroom. That's who we are Friends of the bridegroom. When, because we're called to uh, seek and to save that which is lost by the, whole, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So anyway, putting flesh and blood on this, I can picture John and his disciples baptizing hundreds every day. I mean, his ministry is kicking. And all of a sudden he looks and goes, Oh, wait, look! Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And in the next several days, he's baptizing two or three. Hundreds down to two or three. And his disciple says, Hey, that guy you, you, you pointed out to us a couple weeks ago, hundreds are going to his ministry is growing. They're all going to him now. What about us? It'd be like his Facebook had hundreds of views. And now it's down to single digits. Or his YouTube had a 5K views, and now they're down to single digits. I mean, hey, what gives here? Right? Is that, you see that? Now, what happened here? Watch, B. The Father sent John as his messenger. C. He describes Jesus as he who has the bride as the bridegroom, revealing God's desire and sovereignty. This is the first declaration in the New Testament of Jesus, the bridegroom God. The context of this is when John's disciples were concerned with issues related to purification or dedication to God, verse 25, and the decrease of John's ministry influence, verse 26, both are answered in seeing the God of burning desire. Now what? watch. There arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. 
Verse 26, And they came to John and said, He, Jesus, is baptizing, and all who are coming to him. Verse 27, John said, I have been sent before him. Verse 29, I'm, I'm going with the outline here. He who has the bride, this is his answer. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. I don't have the bride. I'm a friend. Of, our ministry is friends of the bridegroom. I don't have the bride. The bride has the bridegroom. I don't have a church. God has the church. This is, this is, this is really not where we're going to go for a few minutes. Won't be about you, but you will you will you will be able to bear witness about what I'm about ready to say. But they're friends of the bridegroom. He says, and I rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. He goes, you guys are ticked off, and I'm rejoicing greatly. This is what's supposed to happen. Watch, because we're friends of the bridegroom. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Now look at verse thirty. He must increase. But what happens to John? I must decrease. Because I'm just the friend. The bride that I pointed to, or the bridegroom that I pointed to, he has the bride. He gets the numbers. He gets the hits on Facebook. He gets the views. I don't. Until he came, we got all the attention. Because we were preaching the Messiah. Just like the old covenant preachers and prophets did. But now that Jesus has come, I'm, I'm rejoicing greatly that the bride is hearing the bridegroom. I don't have the bride. She's not mine to have. I can't get mad over this because the bridegroom has the bride, not the friends of the bridegroom. This is key because what's happening in the church today, the <clears throat> ministries on TV, big mega churches, they act like they have the bride. And they're promoting themselves. They're increasing their ministries. They're increasing their digital footprint on the internet. All these guys, the more I got to be on more TV stations. I got to be. I got to have my face. I got to have magazines. I got to have a TV station. I got to have a TV program. I got to have the biggest church. I got to have the biggest parking lot. I got to make the most money. Drive the best car. I got to wear the skinny jeans. I got to have all. I got. It's about me. As I drop my mic and walk off the stage, which some do. Pathetic. And, J and John's saying, hey, you know what? What is this thing that the friends of the bridegroom are increasing in Christianity today? He goes, that's not what we're about here. John's disciples needed to learn something. That they didn't have the bride. It's not their church. It's not their ministry. It's the bridegroom's church. It's the bridegroom's ministry. As, as for John's ministry, he says, I, my ministry decreases. It's not about me. It's about as long as he increases. He doesn't, he doesn't draw... John the Baptist is not drawing attention to himself. So when people hear John, they're seeing Jesus. But who are people seeing today... When the friends of the bridegroom talk about the bridegroom, who, who, who are we seeing? See, we're in a generation of um, what they call the cult of personality. It's about the person. It's about his ministry. It's, it's about... <clears throat> I don't know who I was talking to. One, one of you guys I was talking to. And you can't draw attention to yourself. I'm going to tell you something, and it's not legalism. Because it can't be when you understand that you're the friend of the bridegroom. If I come up here and all you remember are my jokes and my funny business or what I wore today, what are you going to leave remembering? Oh, wasn't Pastor cute today? He was so funny. And you see those new skinny jeans he's got on? And that nice jacket and those, those boots or with those shoes, man. What am I doing? I'm not here to draw attention to myself. 
Well, don't we got to look good for God? Ask John the Baptist, did he, did he have to look good for God? The dude wore camel hair, ate locusts. He didn't even have the, I mean, his diet was horrible and his clothing was from Goodwill. Huh? He's not drawing attention to himself, and yet he drew attention to himself, not because of who he was or what. It was the message, and he wouldn't take the attention. He kept pointing it to Jesus, the Messiah. And then when he came, he said, I'm decreased. Now that he's here, I decrease. So when you come here to church, or when you watch these guys on TV, you should never ever, it should never ever dawn on you that they are more popular than Jesus. <clears throat> But it is. It's sad that it is. I remember in the late 80s. Now again, I ain't patting myself on the back because I, I'm looking back and it humbles me that God did this in me clear back in the 80s. When I became pastor of a, of a, of a major church in Clarksburg, um, we had this $10,000 sign we had purchased. Right there on route, what is that route, 19? That Route 19, this gigantic $10,000 sign that everybody would drop by and see. Every pastor had their name up there. I become pastor, and they're getting ready to put my name. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want my name up there. This is, I do, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even 30, 31 years old. I do not want my name up there. And I don't want my name on the door that goes into my office. I just, just put, just put pastor there. I don't want my name there. I don't want my name, and you would, and anybody who was at that church at the time could, could vouch for this. And that I didn't even want my name on the letterhead. So you didn't find my name on my business card, letterhead, the, 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 the sign out front, nothing. Because it's not about me. I don't want my name and face out there or anything. So you, then you got to ask these questions. Why do I have to have Greg Lilly Ministries? You get on our website. You don't see my picture anywhere. You were, if you just get on there, what's this guy's name? You'd have to really dig hard to find out what my name is. You don't see me. You don't see my digital footprint on our website. You don't see pictures of me on that website. You don't, it just says restoration or reformation. What, well, I don't even know what it says. What does it say? That for, I think it says Re reformation network, restoration church or something like that. It doesn't matter. That, and that's a good thing that I can't even tell you what it even says. I don't remember. Because it's not about names, it's about a person. So then what we got? I gotta have the biggest building and the best building, and I gotta have the best worship. I gotta, what is that? What's worship doing? When you've got all the smoke and the lights and people be bopping, what's the attention being drawn to? So what we got today is a bunch of entertainment, a bunch of pretty guys that's, that, that are talented, they got they, they can speak really good, or they've got great voices. But what are they pointing to? What are they pointing to? Look at me on my guitar. Look at me in my skinny jeans. Look how cute I can be and I make the congregation laugh. Who am I pointing to? John the Baptist says, look, when you understand the bride and the bridegroom, number one, friends, he who, ha he who has the bride is the bridegroom. I don't have the bride. It's not about me. If I can make him increase, and I decrease, that's being a, a friend of the bridegroom. Amen. It's, not, it's not about me. It's not about this church. It's, 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 it's about the message. And that's what John is saying. It's not about personality. It's not about entertainment. It's not about drawing people to me or ministries. It's about raising up a different spirit. The Holy Spirit is raising up a different spirit called friends of the bridegroom, which they're not drawing attention to themselves, but a message that draws attention to the person, Jesus, the bridegroom. And people are captured by the bridegroom, not the person who is the friend of the bridegroom. Too much ego in the church today. Too much narcissism in the body of Christ. So let's talk about you. When, what, when people see you and they hear you, what are they hearing and what are they seeing? Are you drawing attention to yourself? Two years ago, I didn't even know what I was going to be preaching on today two years ago. But he took me further into this without even me knowing. Again, this is where the nature of God, this is the new covenant, grace. All of a sudden there's changes taking place in you. You don't know why. You just flow with the changes. And about two years ago, 
I, God just, I, I just saw this and I got sick. I looked at my Facebook. Now, this is me, not you. I am not, I'm not putting this on anybody. This is what he did two years ago. I didn't know what he was doing. I just woke up one day and I thought, God, I'm sick of myself. I don't want to see myself and I don't want anybody else seeing me because it's not about me. And I went through there and I took everything off that wasn't glorifying God, that it made it look like too much of me. I took pictures, I took things, and I just, I just took everything off. That is, because maybe that's who I was then, but what he was doing in my life two years ago, that's not who I was anymore. And I had to adjust what people see. And I took all that stuff off, and I wish I could take more stuff off, I don't know how. I'm trying to get pictures and stuff. It won't, it, it won't delete, so I have to find somebody who knows more about it than I do. But there's still stuff on there I really don't want up there. I just can't get it off of my, my um, profile or my... And after, and after today, I'll probably get on there and take some more stuff off if I can. My point is this. I don't want people seeing me. Whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, this is a narcissistic generation. It's a selfie generation, and that's not the kind of friends God needs as a for for the bridegroom. Where we're promoting ourselves. Look at me, hear me. This no no. We as friends. Well, excuse. Me, this is what I'm saying. Friends of the bridegroom is just not the fivefold ministry. Friends of the bridegroom is just not the preacher. This is about you too. You're part of the narcissistic, egocentric generation that, that's, that's out there. And social media was, is the worst thing that could have happened to the body of Christ. It made us more narcissistic and egocentric. Self-centered. And it ain't about us. And I'm not saying you can't take everything off. I'm just telling you what God did in me two years ago. And after today, I'll go in there and probably shave some more stuff off. I don't. It's not about me. Well, that's, that's, that's false humility. No, it's not, because I don't want my name nowhere. I don't want to be seen nowhere. If I decrease, I'm being a friend of the bridegroom. Amen. If he's increasing, I'm, it's, it's working. And I can't see where anybody who's truly flowing in this will want to rob God of the message. That's good. I, I just... I don't, I don't want, I want to decrease so that he can increase. So, you know, I haven't wore a three-piece suit in God knows how long. And I hate even doing funerals and weddings because that means I've got to dress up to some degree. And the last wedding I did, I said, look, can I come in jeans? Because I don't really want to do it. You know, I, I, it's not in me to dress like that anymore. But it's not in me to dress like a bum either. You know what I want to dress like? I want to dress where I'm comfortable. Okay? I don't I do you understand how hard it is to and how expensive it is to keep up with that flash? And why am I doing it? What is the reason to look good? Well, I want to look good for Jesus. Do you understand what he wants you? He's looking for the heart to look good. Not the not the the cotton and the linen and all the stuff that we put on our He's saying, I don't care what you look like, rend your hearts, not your garments. I ain't concerned about your garments. I'm concerned, are you lovesick, ravished by the heart of God in your heart? Are you wholeheartedly devoted to me? Then show up in jeans. Number two, he who has the bride. From ages past, the Father committed to give Jesus a bride, and John in us, we are the friends of the bridegroom as well as the bride. So, that's John's ministry. And he's, and, and I just can't get away from the fact when he makes this statement. My joy is complete because I hear the bridegroom. My joy is complete. So, our joy is complete not because I put my face up there and I got 500 likes. That makes us happy. Mm -mm. That's flesh. I put something up there and I know they read it and nobody liked it, but it was the glorified Jesus and my joy's complete. That's it. You know, there's what I, I don't know the name. 
but there is something, you, there's a, what, maybe you guys know this, they've done a study that when you put something on Facebook and you get a bunch of likes, there's a release. What is that thing in that, that chemical that's released? Huh? Endorphins. And they live off of that. And so if they put something on Facebook and they usually get 50 to 100 likes and then they put something up there and there's like two, it's a depression. You, you know, what, what happened? You, you, you want all of those likes. No, it's a fact. So I put things up there that people like and, you know, I get a kick out of it if I put a picture up there and everybody likes it. Ooh, you're looking good, Greg! I, yeah, okay. Um, and God knows I've stuck some pictures up there I'm ashamed of. I would never in my life stick up there again. But not, not nudity or nothing, just in case you're just wondering that. But just stuff that's just not, not appropriate, you know. It, it, was, it was appropriate back then for me, but not now. That's the conf that, that's been conformed in the image of Jesus. I can't for the life of me put a picture up that, like, like that anymore. But that's the change of grace. That's what grace does. That's, that's the bride being prepared. We're being transformed from glory to glory. But so I, I challenge you, put something up there about Jesus, about commitment, the cost of discipleship, something like that, and watch very little. Oh, my hits got decreased. That's good. We're not trying to win friends and influence people to us, to him. And I can't win people to him with my ugly mug, mug on, the, on the thing. <laughs> should have, I should have said, I, I, I just set him up for that. Yeah, I did. I don't know. Three, bridegroom revelation. Jesus gives two parables. There's a lot there, and I don't have time. That's why you have the outline there. There's a lot there. He gives two parables. He only taught two parables about the kingdom as a wedding, and both were in the final week of his life. He spoke publicly about one, there's your scripture, and privately about the other. At the end of his ministry, after entering Jerusalem, the final public message that Jesus chose to give Israel and the human race was set forth to set forth his kingdom as a wedding. With his own lips, Jesus gave the invitation to Israel to receive him as their bridegroom, God. And Jesus made two main points in these parables. Now, I'm not going to get these parables. We already have. One is the um, lamp, the virgins in the lamp. And what's he going to say about that? Remember, this is a New Testament overview of the theme of the bride and the bridegroom. And he talks about the ten virgins, five having oil, five not. And what he's saying is, and I don't know what, one day we'll get into this one, John chapter 14, let's say no, Luke chapter 14 and Luke chapter 15. Everybody understands Luke chapter 15, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son. And you will never ever understand those three parables without the context of the chapter before. Because the chapter before flows into chap chapter 15. And when you look at the, the, the parables that Jesus uses, he said that there's a wedding feast. And he sent out his delegated staff to invite everybody to this wedding feast. Right? We'll get into this probably in a week or two to come. But I'll just give you a little bit of it now. He says, there's a wedding. And so he asks everybody to go out, that he, that's his, his friends, his servants, whatever, and compel them to come in. Go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Okay? To the wedding. And they, they come back, and guess what? No one shows up. And it says, and the master was angry. And they said to the master, well, we... They had excuses. I just bought a house. I just got married. I just did this. I just did that. It's not that they didn't want to come. We appreciate the invite, but I'm too busy with life. you got to read that, which we'll look at it more intent when you look at discipleship. But he's like, he got angry. So 
with this ten virgin thing, ah, oh, you know, I'm just too busy to work on cultivating oil, cultivating the relationship. He says, it's not going to work. This thing only, this thing doesn't work just coming up here and getting saved and then going your merry way, business as usual. That doesn't work. That's that primitive Baptist mentality that, hey, I signed the card, I got saved, I'm saved now because I'm, my, my name's in that card thing that's at the church, and now I, I can show up maybe once every blue moon, give throw a couple bucks at him, and go my merry way. It doesn't work like that. So what you got to do is cultivate the relationship, because it is a relationship. You are, you are a, well, what did Paul say? I betrothed you to Christ, I got you engaged. When you got saved, what you got to understand is I put a ring on your finger. Do you, do you guys understand what betroth is in, in, in that culture? <coughs> did you guys get engaged? How long? You were, you were engaged. See, they, that's just a perfect couple. They just do it right. <laughs> a year. But, that, but you realize... If you were in the culture that this Bible was written, you were really already married to her when you put that ring on her finger, the engagement ring. Already married. In fact, you had to get a papers to not do that. If he decided he didn't want to marry her, it was a big deal. It just wasn't, give me my ring back, or I'm breaking up with you. You were already considered married when you were betrothed to somebody. In that culture. Check it out. If you don't believe me, do your homework. Figure, you know, read it and you'll see that it's not like today where we can buy 10 women rings over a period of 10 years and break up and get them break up. And, you know, got, which ring do I give this one? I got about five of them here now. It, doesn't, it didn't work like that. Who you were betrothed to was who you were going to marry. So when, when Paul says, I betrothed you to a husband as a chaste virgin, what he is saying is you're already married. In the eyes of God, you are already married to him, but it consummates, everybody consummates at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But he doesn't see you as just engaged. you got to see this engagement is, in his eyes, he's already committed to you. The love's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any worse. It is exactly how it is. It's a perfect love he has right now. He's treating you as a bride. And you have to understand that. So Jesus talks about this in these parables. Um, the, the ten virgins. But let me just say this, because we're running out of time here. And you got the outline there. If not, a ask for it, and um, I'll send you the email of it. That's why I did this outline. There's no way. There's too much here to cover. I just want to hi highlight this stuff to you. And um, so what Jesus is saying is, it's not going to work uh, just because just you come to church. It's you got to have a relationship. And like we talked about Thursday, how to do that, you talk to him. He talks to you, you worship him, you get in there and you open the scriptures and you talk and you relate and you worship, you praise, you love on him. You feel his love, you encounter him, you experience him. And this is why we call this fasting that we're doing the bridegroom fast because you're going to set time aside so that you can cultivate oil with him on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and a yearly basis. It's a constant cultivation of that relationship which results in oil for the lamb. So they go to Jesus, John's disciples, and they said, your disciples do not fast. And you can, we're not going to look at the scriptures, but Jesus says, the, they don't have to fast. The bridegroom is here. They have the bridegroom. And while the bridegroom is here, why would they fast? He said, but there'll be a day that they will fast when the bridegroom is what? Taken away. Now, this is the first anybody probably heard of Jesus dying. He said, there will be a day that I'll be gone and they will fast. But it's not going to be the same type of fast John, you, and your disciples are doing. So you're fasting for the Messiah. You're fasting to get things from God. You're fasting to merit things from God. You're fasting. Just read the Old Testament and see what they fasted for. They always fasted for something. They fasted for God to bless them. They fasted for God to, to take the enemy away. They were always fasting for something, to God for something. But when Jesus is taken away, they're going to fast. But the new covenant, it's a different kind of fast. I'm not fasting to get anything from him. I'm not fasting to get him to do anything to, for me. It's not even really a fast as much as it is a feast. 
But prove it. John 6, verse 66. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. Well, they thought he was talking about cannibalism. He's like, no, feasting on me, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am life. You feast on me, and out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is the well to quench your thirst. He's, he's, he's the one we feast on. He's the heavenly manna. So fasting is feasting. I'm saying no to entertainment so I can lay hold of him. I'm saying no to food for a couple of hours or a day or whatever so I can lay hold of him. I'm, I'm getting off early from work so I can lay hold of him. Do you understand? See how all this is coming together? The, the, the Why we're doing the Mondays and the Tuesdays, Wednesdays, every, all that? Is we're, just sitting, we're feasting. We're not fasting to get. We're not even fasting to beat our bodies. We're fasting to give time to him. As a woman would want from her husband. This is why he gives the marriage the type and shadow of it. Which if you go to um, the Paul, it talks about Paul, the revelation of Paul on the outline there. I think it's next to the last page, last page. Paul's revelation of the bride in Ephesus, the, the Ephesians. There's just so much there. So much to this. But I, I, I'm... I want, what, what I want you to get out of this is not just the New Testament overview. I want you to see that John, the forerunner, saw him as the bride and the bridegroom. And him as the bride of the friends. Let's not, if we're going to do this, and we have to because it's, it's the message. We're, not, we're going to be friends of the bridegroom. We're not going to draw attention to ourselves. This is, we're doing this not for ourselves. We're not fasting to get something. We're not evangelizing so that we can get more merits from God. We're not here to do anything except for Him alone. And when I start drawing with too much attention to myself, I think the Holy Spirit's going to say, eh. You know, you ever remember that scripture? This came to me driving down here. The scripture where it says women wear modest outfits, yeah. dress modestly. You... you, you you, you, we get, we get all hyped up on. Well, should the skirt be this many inches, that many inches above the knee, down the knee? Can, can, she, can she show any of her upper regions? How long does it, you know, to cover the lower regions? And we get, remember that we don't do that today, but the church did back. Jewelry couldn't touch the skin. Remember that those days, women couldn't wear makeup. Women can't wear jeans. And they always pointed that scripture about women dressing modestly. Again, what are we doing? This is, a, this is a matter of the heart. But there is an aspect of men and women dressing modestly that we're not showing attention to ourselves. I don't care how high your skirt is. I, you know, I, I, I don't care what you do. I want to know why you're doing it. Well, I just want them, well, oh, oh, you want to show something. Okay, well, then you know what? You're, 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 not being, you're not being a friend of the bridegroom. You're drawing attention to yourself. I'm telling you, this, this fixes a lot of stuff that we, we barked and cried and complained over and made it legalistic. And no one listened to us anyway. Who cares? They're going to go out there and do what they want to do, right? If I say no one can wear anything this, that, I'll put law on you, and it makes you want to rebel and do it even more. So now the skirt goes up higher now. Some preachers are like, oh, well, then let's preach law. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get that on the way home, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, no. You fix this thing by going to, the, why are we doing this? Oh, yeah, you're right. That, that, yeah, that, the true friend of the bridegroom will not want to draw attention to themselves. It's not about me. Now, is God against exalting you? No. No, because he says those who are humbled get what? Exalted. Exalted. Now, now you ready for this? You've been wondering why you're not being exalted? Your heart's all wrong. He exalts you. He knows exactly what you'll do with that exaltation. 
You'll grow your ministry. You'll grow your digital footprint on the internet. You'll, your ego will bust open wide. So I can't do that to you. I won't do that to you. But doesn't he want to exalt me? When, you're, when your heart is right. Okay, we're going to teach on this here, but I'm going to close with this. Wasn't going to, but I will. There's a scripture that really, I'm like, God, that's a good scripture, but I just don't know if, that, if, if that's, I just, I wrestled with it, and it's this one. How many remember the story of David and Bathsheba? I know we all know that one. Okay, Bathsheba had the high skirt, low-cut low vest, right? And David watched her. And David ended up committing adultery, right? And what did David do to her husband? Okay? Now, it's pretty bad stuff. And God says, this is a guy after my own heart. What? He's worse than the previous king. And he's, and, and he's a man after your own heart? Okay. So Nathan goes to Jesus, or Nathan goes to David, and says, you're the man, you know the story. But listen to this. God said to David, I made you king. I gave you a palace. I gave you wives. I gave you concubines. You're the richest man, the powerfulest man in Israel. And if that which I did, if that wasn't enough, what did he say? I, just had to ask. I would have given you more. <laughs> what more is there? You are king. Everybody fears you or loves you or hates you, whatever, but you are up there. You're the richest guy. You've got the throne. You've got the best house in the land. You've got wives, beautiful wives, and great concubines that will serve you. And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more. Now, does he say that to Saul? Does he say that to King Saul? Well, you know, you kept King Agag, and I hear the bleeding sheep in the background. If you wanted more livestock and, you know, more subjects to... I, do you hear him saying, if you would have asked, I would have given you more? He doesn't say that to Saul. Why? His heart the, exactly. The key was, I can't do that to Saul. I don't trust... I can't exalt him. He's already exalted to some degree and look what he's done with everything. And I'm going to rip the kingdom out because his heart's all wrong. But David... I don't, I don't care, he's, I mean he cares, but yeah, he's a murderer, he's an adulterer, but man, I can trust him because he's a man after my own heart and I can give him anything he wants. See, you're going to look at yourself, well, I did this, I did that, well, so did David. God's saying, I'm looking at the heart. I'm not looking for perfection. If that was the case, David wouldn't be a man after his own heart. It's not, did he sin, did he not See, people never, the people that, that still to this day hate Jim Baker for what he did. Hates Jimmy Swagger for what he did. And anybody else for what they did. Oh, but David, we can forgive David. But we can't forgive a sinning pastor. And God's like, see, you guys, I'm not looking at their sins. I'm looking at what? Their heart. And I don't care what he or she did. That's a man after my own heart. They keep getting up and loving me. I, I just, I just, I love it. They keep getting up and loving me. Saul, I can't give him anything. He will always go the wrong way because it's about him. David, oh, he, yeah, he blew it, but he's a man after my own heart, and I can trust him with with riches. And didn't Jesus say that if I, if you can't be faithful with earthly unrighteous mammon, how can you be faithful? With the riches of heaven? Again, it's a matter of the heart. So yes, I said all that to say, God wants to exalt you, but not in your narcissistic ways and your egocentricness. That's a word. I just made it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing squat for you. 
because your heart is, it's all about you. And I'm telling you, guys, the church is so into this me gospel. Me, me. We're, we're, we're pathetic friends of the bridegroom. We want to be seen. Look what, what I'm wearing. See my jeans? See my black jacket and my big boots? And watch how I just, like a peacock on the stage, just... And it's so-and-so's ministries. There are names on the marquee. In lights. We even do our acts of kindness and put on there. So-and-so church gave you this. What are we promoting? It's wrong. We are the most self-promoting generation God has ever seen. And we are pathetic friends of the bridegroom. And I'm telling you, not just us, but what are we? Are we decreasing so that he can increase in our individual lives and the life of a church? Just, just look on TV and see these guys, man. I, it's... it's um... And let me just say this. I was talking to a friend about this uh, at lunch last week. And he had just watched some people on TV that morning. And he and I don't watch it very much anymore, but he was saying these names, household names you would know. And he said, as he went through there, he said the message still the same. What God could do for you. How God can elevate you. How God can do this. And it's about you. And it's your time. And this is it. And you're going to get that. And you're going to get this. And you're going to get that. What are we doing? We know that sells. But if you say it's not about you. And, you, and you're going to have to erase your digital footprint. And what if God asked you to take a lower job? Are you willing to decrease can God trust you to change jobs and get a lower pay if it means you to be a greater witness for Him? Oh God, let's not even go there. We won't do it. Would you be willing to give away a really nice vehicle to drive a bad one so somebody else could have it? Now forget, see? No, why would you? Because God wants them to see that it's Him. Doing all this stuff, not you. I, I, God, God has to exalt me before I suffer to some degree. It's got to. And every decision people make is always one: Does this benefit me in the end? That's not decrease. Where did God put John the Baptist? Do you understand? John the Baptist wasn't even part of the mainstream religion in his day? Where do you find John the Baptist? In the synagogue preaching in church every Saturday morning? In the wilderness. In the wilderness. He's not in church. He's not wearing the robes. Hmm? Leather belt and camel vest, hair vest, whatever. Eating, eating from, eating, um, from the land. Not the exotic foods of Egypt. He's eating from the he's eating locusts. And he's not advertising his ministry. He's not on every television station. In fact, you've got to go clear out in the wilderness to get to hear what he says. Just look at the life and ministry of John the Baptist versus these guys today. You go read the Bible. You, you make the care. He was a friend of the bridegroom. Today we're not. And if we're, not in the, if we're not ready to decrease so that he can increase, then it's about us. And we've missed the whole message. And I, and, I, and I know the Western church has. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are the bride. You are the bridegroom. And we are friends of the bridegroom, pointing to the bride. You started this thing off in a wedding in the garden in Genesis. You finish it in the wedding in Revelation. And at the very end, 
the very end, the last thing you say to close this whole Bible out, this whole book, the whole history of man, right up to the end, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let that sink in. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Bridegroom, come. Even so, the Spirit and the Bride, that's the ending. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The call is be ready, be prepared. The Bridegroom is coming. Are we in the process of being prepared? And are we faithful friends of the bridegroom? Religion and its hype and its glitz and glamour has robbed us of relationship. Our lamps are empty, but our lamps are beautiful. They're big, they're colorful. Who's got the biggest lamp? Who's got more gold on their lamps? Whose lamps are the shiniest? And they're all empty of oil. Because the message is not cultivating oil. The message is not Jesus. It's about you. It's self-help. It's self-promotion. That's why God said to me, enough of lamp theology. It's okay, but there's a nut, there's too much. Repent, like Ephesus, repent. I see all your works, it's all, but no, I don't see the oil, I don't see the love. All I see is you and your works. So he stands at the door and knocks. God is looking for people who have a heart for Him, a whole heart, heart, whole heart toward Him, that love Him, that has a yes in their spirit to love Him with all their soul, might, and strength, all their heart. It may not be there, but we keep getting up and we keep pursuing the lover of our souls. God's not looking for perfection. Yes, we will be sinners and we will be weak, but he's not, he's looking for lovers. Do you, do you have a heart after God? That's all. Do you love God? David, I know you're an adulterer. David, I know you screwed your family up, your kids, you raised them wrong. Absalom, look at that piece of mess. And look at your adultery, look at your murdering. I forgive you of those. Because I look beyond your acts. I look beyond your weakness. I look beyond your sin and I see that your heart is right. You love me. You pursue me with a heart of love. You're devoted to me. That's what God's looking for. It's a heart thing. Not what you wear and not how good you are or how big you are, how funny you are. How many friends you have on Facebook? You care less about that. In fact, he'd rather you have no likes than any likes, because you got to decrease. Lord, just just minister this word to us. We are living in a very narcissistic generation that's pulling us into narcissism. And it's not about us. Just let the Holy Spirit just, I don't know what he's saying to you. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what, I mean, we were all over the place this morning and bouncing everywhere, but I don't, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. And I didn't bring this message better. I failed in bringing it as best as I could, I guess, but I'm just to trust the Holy Spirit to take what we spoke in. I think that if we get the fact that 
Christ has to have preeminence in all things. He's got to be the primary thing of our life. Everything else grows strangely dim in the light of Him. Nothing else really matters. It doesn't matter how many friends you have. It doesn't matter whether you're married, single. It doesn't matter what job you have or no job. None of that really matters in comparison to having Him. That's the primary thing. He who has the bride has the bridegroom. That's what matters. Does the bridegroom have you? And do you have him? And that's what he came to prepare you for that wedding. And everything else will happen because of the bridegroom's faithfulness to you being the bride. He will supply your needs. He will take care of you. He will exalt you when you get your heart right, when you let the Holy Spirit tenderize your heart and bring the primary thing as the primary thing. That's his job to do that, called grace. But if you keep resisting this ministry of the Spirit and you keep resisting bridal preparation, you're going to be like, so I can't trust you. Your heart's not right. I can't, I can't exalt you. I have to dethrone you. He will not exalt you. If you've made this thing anything other than Him, He will not and cannot, because of your heart, exalt you. Now, don't go get your heart right to be exalted because that's a bad motive. Again, you're not getting it. So, Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Open our understanding. Help us see this thing as the weeks continue, as we continue preaching on this. Keep preparing our hearts. Keep renewing our minds. God, let that prayer be the number one prayer. Lord, make me a lover of God. Make me a lover of God. Nothing else matters. But what, who I am on that wedding day. What I've done on this end in preparation for that wedding day. This is all about a wedding and my only identity is a bride, a lover of God. I'm going to wait a minute. Does anybody have a word or something? Because I just the Spirit is not letting me close this out right now. So I don't know what's going on. But um, let's just wait a few minutes. If you got a word or you got a song you want to sing, I, I, I don't know. Let's just worship the Lord a little bit for a few minutes and see what God has. Sing. Where, where's Randy? Can you come up here and sing that song um, where you were saying, I love you, you made it personal? Remember that? something close to that. And if you just need to just take the time to just repent and say, Lord God, that's me. I, I've missed this thing. I've gotten off course. I don't know um, where you're at in your heart, but let's get our hearts right this morning. There's no sense in preaching this if it's not going to make a change. If we're not going to make any type of faith commitments or, or grace commitments, whatever you want to call them. But um, let's let this message really prepare us for what God is doing.
for some people here. If not, maybe somebody watching through the internet. But John the Baptist made that statement. And I've emphasized it a little bit. But then God brought it back to, to my spirit as we're waiting here. Is when he said, my joy is made full. I, my joy is fulfilled because I hear the bridegroom's voice. I see the bridegroom. My joy is fulfilled. And he brought that to me because there's too much there's a lot of depression in the body of Christ. There's a lot of discouragement in the body of Christ. Simply because we're looking at what we have or don't have, what's wrong or what's right, what could be right, made wrong, whatever, however your mind works that. But we're walking around with a dark cloud and John the Baptist didn't have anything compared to what the Pharisees had. And he said, my joy is made full because I have the bridegroom, I hear his voice. And I want you, that's, that's the revelation we gotta get. It's not about what we have or don't have, or who we have or not have. I'm telling you, when you get to this place where you find out that all that matters is that you have the bridegroom and he has you. He who has the bride has the bridegroom, or he who has the bridegroom has the bride. Either how where you look at it, the fact is, he's got you, and that our joy should be fulfilled. And I know it's not because we don't we don't see it yet. We're not experiencing that yet. And you know why? Because I think the oil is going low in our lamps. The more oil, the more relationship, the more heart in the matter, the more that we experience and encounter Him, and, it's, and our lamps begin to overflow, then you will be like John, that, and he was a bright and shining lamp, the Bible says. It won't matter whether I got that job or not. It won't matter whether I didn't get that or didn't get that. What I have, you don't understand, why are you so happy? You don't have anything. I have the bridegroom. What do you mean? This is what it's all about. I got what it's all about. I don't need these other things to be happy. I have the bridegroom. My joy is full. Nothing else matters. And I trust the bridegroom that I have to take care of my matters. Amen? You've got the bridegroom. Now let's be friends of the bridegroom. Let's not draw attention to ourselves. Let everything we do and say be all for the glory of God. Faithful witnesses who will not merchandise Jesus for our own sordid gain. So be blessed and we'll see you Thursday night. <laughs>